Hello all, welcome to the webinar. We're just waiting for uh, dele uh, delegates to um, come in and we'll start in a few moments. We're just about to go live on Facebook as well. So sorry that we're seeing. Um, sorry, I, 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 have a, I have a second device going in the background that I need to stop. So. Just go, about to go live on Facebook as well. Give me one moment. So we have over 125 people now in attendance. So we'll commence the, the webinar. You're very welcome. Welcome to the NASC and Migrant, uh, uh, welcome to the NASC, the Migrant and Refugee Rights Centre and UCD School of Law rapid seminar on the white paper to end direct provision. I am Liam Thornton. I'm an associate professor in UCD School of Law. Um, and this joint webinar builds upon our previous webinar series in November, December 2020, exploring the day report. You can watch back all the previous sessions from the Exploring Day Report uh, webinar on NASC's website, nascarland.org. Now, with over 150 of you now in attendance at the webinar today, I recognize many, many names amongst the webinar delegates who have campaigned to end direct provision for over 20 years now, before and after its establishment. Now we have a government commitment to end direct provision by 2024. Just 12 months ago, speaking for myself here only, I did not believe that there was the political will to end the system of direct provision. We now have the acceptance that the system of direct provision violates fundamental human rights of persons seeking protection and provides a framework to move away from this degrading system of direct provision. This isn't to say that the white paper is, in, is perfect in every way, that it provides the level of detail that we should expect, but it's a start. And this webinar seeks to explain and analyze the webinar, or sorry, the white paper, but is not a detailed exploration, maybe of every single aspect of the white paper. So without further ado, I'd like to now introduce the panel to you. <clears throat> Our panel today, Bulalani Nafako, political scientist, PhD student, policy expert. Bulalani, as many of you may know, is an activist with the Movement of Asylum Seekers in Ireland. And Bulalani, along with Fiona Finn, were members of the Day Advisory Group. Fiona Finn, CEO of NAS, the Migrant and Refugee Rights Centre, legal expert, marketing professional with over two decades of experience in fields of social justice, law and immigration. <clears throat> Poet, writer, political scientist and cur uh, current student, um, Ola Mustafa. Ola is a published author, a published poet and has spoken eloquently um, and publicly on her experiences uh, within direct provision and bring significant expertise on issues uh, pertinent to the white paper. Before I call on our first speaker, Bulalani, just for those the attendees, please use the question function on Zoom. I will coll be collating questions. I'll put a selection of questions to the panel. If you don't have a question but have a comment that you would like to communicate to us, please put that in the Q&A function as well, and I will incorporate it or indeed put that um, analysis to the panel. Uh, the raise hand and chat functions are disabled for the webinar, nothing that I have control over. And finally, the hashtag for Twitter, Facebook, and all the other social media outlets is hashtag DP white paper. So without further ado, 
I call upon our first speaker, Bulalani. Bulalani. Uh, good morning and good morning uh, to the uh, delegates in the seminar. Um, thank you for organizing uh, very, very quickly uh, the seminar to engage on the white paper. Uh, from the very start, the movement of asylum seekers in Ireland um, has campaigned for an end to the system of direct provision, was founded to campaign for an end to the system of direct provision to ensure that asylum seekers actually uh, live in the community like everybody else in Ireland, unsegregated, uh, 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 but also unstripped of the personal autonomy the, uh, uh, that all of us have become accustomed to from back to being able to uh, decide your own destiny to shape major and the minor aspects of your life, your everyday aspects of your life, waking up, uh, uh, going to, you know, preparing your children to go to school, uh, preparing their lunches and sending them to school and uh, uh, going about your everyday life basically, like everybody else, uh, with the, all these problems that are associated with everyday life. We we crave those uh, for a very long time in direct provision, um, not being able to, to drive our own uh, lives in that manner. And so from the very get-go, we've campaigned for an end to direct provision and the right to work for asylum seekers, but also access to education and an end to the deportation re regime. We are pleased to see that the government has committed to ending uh, the system of direct provision, um, uh, uh, but hopeful, uh, 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 and mindful that that will not uh, uh, be an easy task um, because we um, there are over uh, uh, 40 direct provision centers with thousands of people in them. Um, and the white paper doesn't speak to that. And that's one of the major concerns. So what I'll be talking to today um, is about the concerns that we have uh, 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 in reading the white paper and the need for those to be one. Uh, clarified, but also to be uh, 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 clarified in law, uh, because the white there is no intention in the white paper to put any of the proposed changes in legislation. Um, if we could briefly go back to why that is necessary, go back to when direct provision was established. The first act of establishing direct provision was a very uh, concerted effort to remove asylum seekers from general welfare support systems. Uh, but also from general housing support systems um, and introduce a dispersal system that would allow the government to ship asylum seekers at will from one uh, county to the next, um, as if we are livestock. And that's been happening for the past 20 years. Uh, and the proposal in the white paper ensures that actually continues. Um, and that's one of the problematic areas, the dispersal policy, because we want to see asylum seekers living uh, uh, with full autonomy uh, uh, over their allies. Uh, nobody else in Ireland gets moved from one part of the country to the next um, at the will of the government, uh, except for asylum seekers and prisoners. Um, and that's for us is uh, concerning. The second uh, aspect that introduced, uh, of course, direct provision uh, was the removal of rights to having access to the welfare uh, 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 payment system. For us, while the, the, the intention to introduce uh, an international protection applicant uh, payment that is uh, uh, that mirrors whatever payment structure exists for Irish people, the fundamental problem will be that it's not on a statutory footing and therefore it becomes very difficult to challenge or to appeal uh, uh, welfare refusals if they aren't grounded in law, for instance, uh, if you think about the difference between administrative welfare schemes uh, and schemes that are actually rooted and have a well-established legal regimes, such as the supplementary welfare uh, allowance payments, which have uh, a legal requirements such as assessing the person's uh, 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 income and their needs um, and their ability to meet those needs and then providing support based on that. Um, uh, if that isn't rooted in law for asylum seekers, it becomes very problematic. If you go back to exploring direct provision, you will see where there was quite a significant discretion in terms of how community welfare offices administer welfare payments to asylum seekers at the introduction of direct provision, uh, because it wasn't rooted in law. And that was one of the problems that they highlighted, um, the administrators themselves highlighted that it was difficult for them to make those decisions without clear guidance in law. 
and asked for uh, legislation to be enacted. And they found it problematic that there, were, there, there was a, a, a separate payment being introduced for asylum seekers, which would be uh, uh, administered uh, uh, separately to other payments. Uh, uh, and so it's very problematic for us that we're still moving to a direction of not including asylum seekers into ordinary welfare systems that already exist, but we seek to be creating new ones that aren't rooted in law. Again, in, on housing, if you remember a few weeks ago, an asylum seeker was evicted from a direct provision center at the will of the operator of the direct provision center acting with the state. Um, he was given a transfer to a direct provision center um, that is in a different county uh, uh, from uh, Kildare to Galway. He wasn't given a chance to appeal uh, the decision. He wasn't given a hearing because it the, the, the transfer letter alleges that he had some breach of house rules. Um, and it also alleges that in, the, in, 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 in he committed a violent act. There was no uh, uh, hearing process. If you remember in the constitution, it gives us the right to fair process, um, you know, uh, we, 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 in fair processes, you expect a hearing that you'd go and defend uh, uh, yourself and have your, your, and, and your voice heard. Uh, there was no such thing. The first thing they did was give him the letter. The second thing was uh, call the guardian to report trespassing and then have him uh, moved from them. He didn't get a hearing. He didn't get uh, 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 an opportunity to appeal, to challenge the decision, and he was moved to me. If you go back to before uh, uh, 2000, when direct provision was introduced, that wouldn't have happened because there was no dispersal system and asylum seekers had what we call tenancy rights like everybody else in the country. So if you were, for instance, in a rented accommodation, um, you have granted the same protection, legal protections as everybody else in the country. Um, and that will not be the case post white, uh, post December, 2024. Uh, asylum seekers will still be subjected to the whims of the government, uh, uh, bureaucrats who will be administering the new international protection uh, support services, um, but also the, uh, the operators, uh, the, who are the approved housing bodies and uh, NGOs who will be uh, uh, implementing the alternative to direct provision. Um, and so you still have a very gray area there. It doesn't provide legal protections in terms of uh, uh, people moving from one, uh, 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 from one part to the next, but also in terms of their accommodation. Um, uh, the other part, of course, it's very, very uh, uh, problematic from when the minister speaks about it. He does it with a smile. He says uh, 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 that for you, 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 the accommodation is divided into two phases. So you move on from phase one to phase two, which is in the community, uh, if you haven't had a decision. Um, and that needs to be clarified because what they could be meaning is that if you have had a first instance decision in the first four months, you're not moving on from direct provision to uh, living in the community. Um, uh, and that needs to, to be something that needs to be removed at all from the thinking of uh, civil servants who drafted the white paper, but also from politicians because it's very, very problematic. It, it embraces the idea of direct provision for some category of asylum seekers. If we're saying that uh, uh, people who have had a decision will stay in, uh, uh, in the reception uh, uh, process because uh, if the idea is to ensure that everybody lives with dignity um, and is not segregated and is uh, integrated in, into the, the, the community while they wait for an asylum claim, um, it should be all asylum seekers moving on from phase one to phase two of the, the accommodation. And of course, the last aspect is on the right to work. Um, we've seen uh, 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 changes uh, back in May, the Catherine Day report, uh, 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 the Catherine Day group issued an interim uh, recommendations to the government and parties forming government, uh, and they embraced them. They embraced them in the program for government and said, you know, we have bureaucrats ready to uh, put forward proposals to uh, uh, implement these. These will be actioned by government um, when government is, uh, is, start, is formed. Uh, we saw a change in the right to work. The, uh, the white paper recognizes that all submissions from civil society uh, uh, campaigned for a much lesser than the six months uh, time limit that is imposed on asylum seekers to wait for accessing the labor market. Um, but the government decided to go with what the civil servants said again. Uh, and that is problematic for us because in real uh, uh, life experiences of asylum seekers, uh, the supports that are provided by the states are never enough 
to pro, to ensure that a suitable standard of living is provided for, especially for people who have children. While they might say that they are going to give asylum seeking children access to the child benefit, and of course the parents would have uh, welfare support that may, that uh, mirror the support given to Irish people. Still, people who even people who are working who have jobs, Irish people who have jobs, struggle to meet the uh, the back to school expenses at the start of the academic year. And so it would be much more difficult for people who actually don't have jobs, people who aren't allowed to work, uh, to meet those uh, uh, expenses. So we, we still need uh, to see a much more liberal access to the, liberal, to the labor market. I will pause there. I think I, I, I timed myself, so I'm right on 10 minutes and will engage further in questions. Yeah, by my watch, you had 10 seconds left, Bulalani, but thank you very much for, um, for, um, for your contributions. In particular, I think two of the key points you made, legalization and also bureau bureaucracy. How will the bureaucratic state engage with these issues, given that we have 20 years of evidence of the very concerning manner in which civil servants or the bureaucracy dealt with these issues when direct provision, you know, as they are now. Um, and we may come back to some of those um, issues. Uh, a reminder, Q&A is open. We will deal with questions once all speakers have spoken and then do engage on social media with the hashtag DP White Paper. Our next speaker, Fiona Finn. Fiona. Hey, thank you, Liam. Um, and... Um, it's great to be here this morning and yeah, I'm delighted that the, um, the seminar was um, organised in such so quickly after the publication of the, of, of the report. I think from NASC's perspective, um, we believe the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth, I think they've really kind of grasped the nettle and they've taken the opportunity to radically transform the reception process in Ireland. I think for us, I think the white paper very clearly and thoughtfully sets out how reception support should be provided to people in the international protection process. And that very much, I think, is reflected in the language of the report. I mean, the language is, in, in our view, it's very inclusive and it's speaking to, not at the applicants. And the fact that the report has now been translated, the, the executive summary has been translated into six languages and it's been made available, you know, as widely as possible. I think for us, that's a first. And again, I think it's an indication of, I suppose, the ambition and the inclusivity of the report. And I think this, this approach and the, the tone of the white paper is, is markedly different from any government policy or paper um, that we have seen to date. Um, it marks a sea change in the way the Irish state um, proposes to provide and uphold the rights of people seeking protection in Ireland. And I think for years we heard, and it was despite the criticism from international bodies, and you know, in national human rights bodies that direct provision, it's, it's the only way that we can do it. We, it's the only way that we can live up to our obligations for see, people seeking protection. And we were also told that for years that nobody has come up with a clear alternative to direct provision. Now, clearly that's not the case. I mean, in a few short, a few short months, building on all the work that has been done over the previous years, the white paper sets out a new human rights compliant approach. Is it perfect? Of course not. All systems will have their flaws but it is a seismic shift in government policy. And I think this needs to be acknowledged and recognized. In the forward, Minister O'Gorman noted that direct provision, as it was, failed to respect the dignity and human rights of individuals. And I think this report proposes how it's going to address this. And the starting point of, the new, of this new approach is, as Antishuk notes in his forward, is that it takes a human rights and equality-based approach and it places this at the center of this new reception model. It recommends an ambitious new accommodation model, which is consistent for the most part with the recommendations made in the day report, although the model of delivery is different. And I think they went further in, in some regards. So the white paper will see people living in initial reception centers for a period of no longer than four months following their initial arrival in the state. So during their, their initial stay, and they'll be staying in a state-owned and state-provided reception center where integration supports, including information about their rights, health assessments, inten intensive English language and everything will be front-loaded. And then after four months following an assessment of their accommodation and, and health needs, 
and protect protection applicants then will be moved to accommodation in the community. And this accommodation will be delivered through a multi-strand approach. But I think there's a very strong emphasis here on the delivery of a not-for-profit system. I think Minister O'Gorman had consistently stated that not-for-profit approach would be a key feature of the new model. And I think this is fairly reflected throughout the, the, the white paper. So I think the proposals for delivery of this model, it will require the state to embark on an extensive program of building and acquisition of accommodation for protection applicants. And we know that's not an easy task. But I think if this is achieved, this ambitious program will ensure that the state will have a permanent accommodation stock for people seeking protection. And the chosen model for the delivery is a partnership approach with approved housing bodies who will build and acquire new permanent capacity working with the housing agency and approved housing bodies will manage the properties and NGOs will provide the wraparound supports. So I think in our view, this takes like what was long called for an integration from day one approach. Like to date, asylum seekers were completely excluded from formal state integration policy until such time as they had a residency permission. And this new inclusive approach is very welcome and it reflects best practice from other European countries. So following the initial stay of four months, um, international protection applicants will be moved to accommodation in the community. In stage one, there's gonna be like a caseworker system will be set up. And this caseworker will work with applicants and their families to identify their accommodation options and the ones that are suitable for their needs. And applicants, and I think this is really important that they will be consulted as to their preference with regard to accommodation, the type of accommodation and the location. And there's a special mention in there for students. So people who are currently studying in higher, higher uh, college courses of higher education and universities will be accommodated near their in education institution as far as possible. So the, you know, that, that hasn't happened today. So before we've had students who were maybe, you know, living in, in a direct provision centre in Cork, studying in UTC, and they would be moved to a centre in Galway with no regard for, for, for the continuation of their education. So I think that's important. So the decision as to phase two accommodation, as I said, subject to family composition, availability and the, applicant and the applicant's preferences. So a single person, for example, would be offered a different type of accommodation to that for, that's offered to families, but no single person will ever have to share accommodation again. And that's true as well for the, for the initial reception center. And I think it's very important for us that a clear distinction is, is, is drawn between families or individuals who may be considered vulnerable and may require additional support and families and individuals who, who, who aren't particularly vulnerable. And I think this is very important because it recognizes the autonomy and the agency of people in the process. And it's moving us away from that over paternalistic approach that was the hallmark of direct provision. And it was like, I think it was an approach that created a culture of dependency and institutionalization. So under these proposals, families and, and individuals will be able to get on with their lives. And I think critical to this then is a very welcome proposal that people seeking protection will receive a supplementary welfare allowance rate, rate equivalent to that of current rates. And there is proposals for a child benefit type payment um, for all children who are going through the process. And I take Bulalani's point about this being an administrative, an administrative scheme and all the problems that are uh, entailed in, in, in that particular approach. But I think as a principle, it's a very good one. And um, we particularly welcome as well the proposals around unaccompanied minors. So unaccompanied minors who are currently in the system, there is a proposal that their application for um, protection will be processed before their 18th birthday. Now, this is absolutely critical and crucial because if a decision is reached after an unaccompanied minor's 18th birthday, they lose the right to family reunification. And this is absolutely a critical right. And there's also a proposal in there to um, provide greater prioritized supports for housing for unaccompanied minors once their decision, once a decision on their application has been made. Again, I think that's recognition that you know, moving unaccompanied minors out of foster care directly into direct provision at the age of 18 is no longer is no longer acceptable. And it's great to see that's not going to happen. Um, there is a proposal as well on greater access to education. And I think it's very welcome. In particular, the proposal to waive the fees for um, the international student charges for post leaving cert courses. So currently these fees run at about 3,600 euros per applicant. And, these, and so any applicant that's um, established a labour market access will have their fees 
to um, higher level education waived. Like we, each year, not in, in through our uh, Connect project, um, which worked with an awful lot of kind of migrant children and young people, those kids who are looking to go on to do a PLC course, they just can't afford it. And these are some kids that may not want to go on to third level, they may not be ready to go on to third level, and this is a very kind of an important path for them, really, so that they can access um, that, that they can access university and, and, and higher level courses and in, in or further level further education courses in the long run. And what we have to do each year is set up a GoFundMe to try and you know publicly fund so these kids can can attend college, according to in line with the new paper. Now that's that's. That, that that's no longer going to happen, which I think is really positive. I think from my reading of it, it appears that there's a very clear move to take like a whole of government approach here. And that was one of the key recommendations of the Bay Report. So it seems like the Tusla, Department of Higher Education, the HSE, all of these seem to very strongly feature in the supports proposed in the paper. We are very disappointed, however, at the lack of ambition that's shown by the Department of Justice in the white paper. And like the language used by the department, I think for us really shines out. I mean, in their relevant sections, it's markedly different from the inclusive language that's found throughout the report. They refer to the litigious nature of the process, and they seem to blame the delay, delays in the process at the door of protection applicants. Now, we welcome the commitment for the processing of applications within a six month period, but we do question their ability to be able to achieve this given that they seem to be heavily reliant on the creation of a new computer system as the main tool. So I think having a fair and efficient status determination process is absolutely critical if these ambitious proposals for a new system are to be achieved. The DA report set out very clear proposals for improving the process, and a key plank of, this, of these proposals was to clear the backlog and have sufficient and additional resourcing of both the International Protection Office and the Tribunal. And it also recommended very clear structural reforms and a move away from the current overemphasis use on, on private practitioners. And one of the key reforms outlined in both the Day Report and the McMahon Report was the need for proper early legal advice and the proper resorting of the legal aid board to ensure that applicants will have access to legal advice and support throughout the process. Now, costings were provided by the legal aid board to the Day Group to achieve this. One but the minute, white paper Fiona. notes okay, that this information will be provided um, in 2022 and nothing will be implemented until 2023. Now, I suppose, I, I, I suppose it's very difficult for us to see why this delay is there because this has already been costed as part of the day report. The information is, all, is already there and it's already budgeted for as part of the reform of the protection process. And I think we've been really clear that it's critically important to the success of ending direct provision that the backlog of cases is addressed and the recommendation in the day report to immediately establish a dedicated case processing panel to examine the cases of people who spent two years or more in the international process should be implemented immediately. And we should immediately begin the reform of the determination process. So I think we're calling on the Department of Justice really to apply the same bravery and ambition outlined in the accommodation process to the, to the determination process. I think to do otherwise risks placing the proposal to end direct provision in jeopardy. I would just also like to add that 2024 will seem like a long way off for many people who are currently in the system and that the state has a lot of work to do to gain the trust of people who are currently living in direct provision. And I think that people need to know and need to be assured that this time it's different, that this time direct provision will finally end. So I think it's important that all actions that can be delivered sooner must be delivered sooner. So we need to see the implementation of critical changes like access to bank accounts, driver's license, a reduction in the backlogs. I think it's crucial to beginning to rebuild or to build people's trust that this time it will be different and that this time direct provision will end. Thank you. Thanks very much, Fiona, and um, you, you've given an excellent summary of the key recommendations of, um, of in the white paper, and also some key concerns echoed by NASC and many others revolving around justices seeming disengagement from this, that the day report, its recommendations were, this needs to be all done as part of one process, telling us to wait for till Q 2023 
it isn't acceptable. So um, there is a lot of questions coming in um, on many of the contributions um, or of the contributions from Bulalani and Fiona. We will get to those questions after um, our, um, our final speaker, um, um, Ola uh, Mustafa. Ola, over to you. Thank you very much, Liam, and thank you um, to Fiona and and Bulelani. And first of all, I would like to I would like to uh, say very well done to everyone that was involved in the Catherine Day um, group. I don't know how Bulelani you survived. I don't know how Fiona and your group. I don't, I don't know how you survived, but uh, well done and um, a very fair play to to every one of you. And I I looked at the the, the group uh, the report, and I think my the, my favorite part, if if, they, if I if it's proper to use that word, my the favorite part is uh, from page fifty nine to page sixty four, and it's recognized uh, pathways for LGBTQ people, um, older people, uh, people with disabilities, and religious and cultural support. These are some of the things that has been lacking in the system for a while, and so you would uh, you would often see when people talk about things that happen to them where they are coming from, and it sounds like well that. That, that sounds like a taboo it's not it's not um it's not something that is you know it's it is it is inconceivable you know oh you don't look gay enough you don't look uh, bisexual you don't look uh, lesbian enough you know all those kind of um derogatory terms that that that, that is used on people and you know just uh it it further traumatizes them and sends them down into that downward spiral of life that it, they're trying to to live behind. So that's um that is a very a very good one, and also um it recognized uh, domestic violence, uh, sexual uh, abuse, and gender based violence. Believe me or not, we've heard a lot of asylum seekers who were victim of domestic violence from their country go for interviews and come back to say that person that interviewed me said uh, domestic violence is not a ground for, for me to come here to seek asylum. That is very devastating. People seek asylum for, for different reasons. And according to, to the Irish law, it is left for you to prove that your life is in danger. It is left for, for the applicant to prove that if I, if I continue staying in this uh, country where, I've, where I'm, uh, I've been a victim of this situation, I may lose my life. It is not in your place as a, as a case worker to declare them guilty, you know, until until proven innocent. That's that's how the that, that's how the direct provision or the international uh, protection application system works. As far as asylum seekers are concerned, you are you are you are guilty, and then it's left for you to prove your prove your innocence. And it's a welcome development that the the, the white paper recognizes that there should be some support for people who have been victim of domestic violence, FGM, and gender based uh, violence, and then the right to work. And then um, driver's license and, and, and bank accounts and, and all that. It is um, they are all uh, welcome developments. However, when uh, as regards the right to work, we still haven't seen um, uh, the commitment to to issue a blanket right to work to to all asylum seekers. I've been here for nearly seven years now, and I only got my right to work two weeks ago. And that is, you know, I, I'm looking at that letter and, and it just feels like, you know, it's so it's so surreal. Like you, you feel like, I don't know, I, I, I was interviewed on the phone by someone. And before I attended that interview, I had to call people who have been working to, to you know, put me through the, the, the process of answering interview questions and, and all that. That is so, it is so dehumanizing, having to have sat down for the past seven years and not been able to do anything. There are still a lot of people who are still in that category who are not mentioned in the white paper that we don't know if they will be getting getting the right to work tomorrow or next week or there's there's no mention of that and also the the, the education part as well there was no mention of children whose parents are on uh, deportation being able to to avail of um of free education or, or proceeding to third level education and by implication that means uh Irish refugee council uh, NASC and Massey and all all the all these NGOs would have to go back to the good old you know setting up GoFundMe pages to to raise funds for these children, which is I I I, I um it is very painful you know it's not their fault that their parents are are on deportation. Most of these children grew up in this system. They are not even aware of why 
they came to Ireland in the first place. So why should they be made to, you know, pay for for something that is is is, is not a crime? Seeking asylum is is not is not a crime. And also, it didn't um, address uh, the people living outside of uh, direct provision. And we've heard the former Taoiseach, uh, Leo Varadkar, saying people are not forced to live in direct provision. No, people are forced, you know, you are compelled to live in direct provision because the moment you step your foot outside of that gate, you lose all the benefits that is attached to living in direct provision. So why would you, why would you want to live if you know you're going out there and you don't have you don't have any any form of support. Your medical card is taken off you. You don't you don't have any any form of um, any form of, of, of support. So if you're if you're housing your friends in the for for two weeks, you know that's fine. Or you're housing them for one month, two months, three months. From if my friend has been housing me since I came in 2014, she would have thrown my bags out all this while because you never envisage that you'll be here seven years after and still talking about about this system and, and how it, it delays uh, people and, 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 and all that, you know, it didn't address that. I think people should be, if I choose not to, not to live in, in a reception area, if I choose to just file my application and go live with my friends, I should still be able to avail of all the support that is available to those who are living in direct provision and, and not the government telling us the only option that we have to offer is our, our, our tents and camps. The Atlone uh, Direct Provision Center is more or less like more or less like a camp, so there's no there's no um, there's no difference. Also, uh, uh, the the issue of interagency working working together, you know, we all know uh, and we can see it now. The only department that is engaging enough, at least from my own perspective, engaging enough with asylum seekers to to you know kind of build that trust between between asylum seekers and government would be the Department of uh, Children and uh, that would be that would fall under the under the remit of uh, um, Minister Rodrigue Ogoman. I don't see that commitment from Minister McKenzie, and that's that that it just further reiterates the fact that other agencies don't want to deal with asylum seekers. If we, I don't see that commitment from other departments. Take, take for instance, Department of Transport. We've been fighting for driver's license issues for years and years, and there is no end in sight. There is no. There is nothing stopping the Department of Transport coming up with some kind of um, uh, some kind of avenue for asylum seekers to avail of of of, uh, of driver's license as long as they can afford to pay pay for insurance and all that. And the only thing is the only excuse is oh driver's license are a valid form of uh, identification and 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 all that. It, it just it just begs that question that you know do you see people who are in direct provision as as humans? Do you see? Do you place faces behind all those ID numbers that you have stored on your, on your, on your, uh, on your database? And also, we can see that in uh, the attitude of of, of uh, <laughs> the minister for the Department of Housing as well. You know, they don't want to deal with. They don't want to be involved in housing asylum seekers. We're not saying build uh, duplexes and build mansions and and put asylum seekers in there. The last time I checked, there are over 200,000 empty houses in Ireland now. Enough to house Irish people, enough to house travelers, enough to house asylum seekers. So we are not saying prioritize us and you know, house us in those um, in those empty luxury apartments in, in, in Dublin, house us in those luxury apartments in Cork and, and all those all those places. No, all we are saying is let asylum seekers live independently in the community. Let them, let them, uh, you know, be, be be responsible for their own lives. We can we can do this by ourselves. At the end of the day, nobody comes here to to uh, be subjected to further um, further poverty. We don't we don't travel seven rivers and seven seas just to come and compare poverty. You know, I want to go and see how how much I can suffer in Ireland. You know, compared to how I can suffer when I'm when I'm back home. No. People want to people want to live their lives. They want to live independently. And also, um, we can see that in when when the right to work was uh, when it was put in place, we see how how much people took that on board and how people were willing to, to start to start working. I got my my right to work two weeks ago, and I already got a job. Nobody wants to sit down here and you know wait for six months, wait for nine months before you're allowed to work. It just doesn't make sense. People are coming from places and they have their lives. There are people who came here with degrees and people who had who were working, who were functioning as humans where they were coming from. And I think 
transitioning or coming here shouldn't put a stop to, to their lives. They should be able to continue functioning and the way they were functioning when, when they came here. And lastly, I know I'm running out of time. I would like to address those who sees that uh, 164 million euros has been budgeted for this. And you're like, oh, what about us? Oh, what about this? We only get 38 euros, 80 cents out of those millions that you, that you see. So I would like to encourage you to channel your anger to the right places. And we, we need we need you we need your anger on our side, you know. Get angry at, at, at those who are pumping the the millions of nairas into the pockets of uh, private um, of private people, you know. And and the fight is not between is not between you and I. The fight is between you and I versus injustice. Thank you. What a powerful way to finish, Ola. The fight is not between you and I. It's be it's about injustice and highlighting so many other issues that, that we can discuss as regards status determination. Simply treating people as human beings. That's what I certainly took from your contribution. Now, we have a significant number of questions. We're not going to get to all the questions, okay? So apologies in advance, but there are a number of questions that I'd like to put to members of, um, um, of uh, the panel. Um, a key question from Paula and others that have come up is that, is direct provision a stain in our, on our collective consciousness? And does the panel think direct provision is on its way out? Is the white paper going to, if implemented, end direct provision? Bulalani, I'll come to you first on that. Unmute. <laughs> you're still, you're I'm still going muted. on and on and on. <laughs> I started just talking. Um, for, I remember when we went back to the DAL in May 2019, and uh, one of the senators, uh, Naya, I can't remember his last name now. Uh, spoke uh, 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 very frankly that there are some people in Irish society who don't see anything wrong with the system of direct provision because, you know, when you're given a bed and three meals a day and you should be grand with it, um, they don't consider the real impact on the life of a person who is in, uh, an enforced idleness, uh, uh, who is denied of very basic, basic fundamental human right to privacy. Uh, the fundamental human right to dignity that comes with having a private life, a family life, best interest of the child. Uh, those are things that have been breached for the past 20 years and people who are uh, in the system of their world. So we, there is a need uh, to set, uh, for some soul searching in terms of the Irish state, uh, but also in terms of Irish people pushing their government to one, uh, 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 admit that one day breached fundamental human rights. I saw Minister uh, Roderick O'Gorman saying that uh, provision has breached the dignity of people, the right to dignity for people in direct provision. And we need to see that. The second part, of course, is action um, in terms of redress. Uh, how do we go about redressing those uh, hurts and the pain that has been inflicted uh, by the state on people seeking asylum over the years um, and prevent it from ever occurring again? Uh, we don't uh, uh, prevent it from occurring again by sweeping it under the carpet as seems to be the plan now. Like, oh, we 20, December 2024 comes and then it's like, oh, we don't have direct provision anymore. That problem is taken care of. No, no, no. Um, we need justice. Uh, we need to see uh, a, a state that is atoning uh, for its sins, as it were. So we we do need some soul searching in terms of uh, the Irish, uh, the political consciousness, um, but also people in general, because there are people in Ireland today who still say, ah, oh, it's grand, they don't appreciate the very harm that has been uh, inflicted on people in direct provision. Uh, for us, campaigning for redress will be a very painful process, but it is necessary um, in seeing, uh, in ensuring that the Irish state one recognizes that it has uh, uh, caused the harm, uh, but also ensuring that that harm is prevented from uh, happening in uh, in future. Because who knows what will happen in government? Uh, will this current government survive until December 2024? Um, and what happens um, uh, when 
the term of government finishes and another government comes in, they roll back and go back to the same old. Because what we are not seeing is a commitment from all uh, 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 cabinet ministers that this is we will take concrete steps to move away from what we've been doing for the past 20 years and do things differently. Ola, do you have any thoughts on uh, on that question uh, about, well, wh what next? Or, or do you believe that the white paper will ultimately be implemented? Oh. I, I was, uh, we, we've discussed this uh, several times with Bulilani and I said, I would like to play the devil's advocate here. <laughs> and, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of uh, keeping all this responsibility on Minister Rodrigo Goman, you know. I see how much he's, he, he's uh, committed to, to um, putting in a kind of, he's putting in a kind of a positive steps to ensuring that at least his department take responsibilities for the aspects that has to do with his own uh, department. However, I, I, am, I am hoping and I am, would I use optimistic? I'm pseudo optimistic. Let me, let me, let me, let me put it that way, that things, things would, would change. And also, um, Bulilani was talking about people who say uh, we didn't know that this, uh, this was going on and all that. People need not to get to know about the reprovision when disaster happens. So, you don't you don't need to get to know about the reprovision when you hear that somebody suicided in in a, in a particular center then you go oh i didn't know that was going on oh i didn't know that was going on you know people only get angry when they hear when they hear that asylum seekers go they go to the to the post office and they get money and they're like ah how dare you you know you, this is happening under your watch this is being done to people in your name in 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 your name and if you are hungry at the fact that people's rights are being trampled upon and people are being treated unfairly, I think it is it is high time that you you know place a, a tab on that and you know make sure you follow up, contact your TDs, get to know what what they are doing about about this system, get to know what it is that they, that they, that they plan to to put to to you know to do um, subsequently uh, uh, from from the from the publishing of this um, of this uh, white paper and. Uh, the last time we got in touch with the with some of the TDs here, Old Convent happens to be the only direct provision center in the whole of County Mayo, and we have little or no no um, interaction with most of the TDs here. Uh, so we want to see that positive, you know, uh, attitude and a change in in in, in perspectives. You know, shift in it doesn't it doesn't concern me. It's not. It doesn't fall under my remit. It doesn't fall under my department. So I'm not. I'm not just going to. I'm not going to deal with that. Except you contact them on a personal basis. It is not all of us that has that that tenacity to to contact politicians. It's not everyone that looks that that, that is like Bulilani. It's not everyone that is like Loki. It's not everyone that is like Donna. You know, there are people whose lives are, you know, affected in a very unimaginable way and would like. To get these politicians on board, and just they don't they don't know how to how to go about it. So I think there should be that sh that shift in in attitude, you know, that attitudinal change and and the political will to to ensure that this time we wouldn't we wouldn't be looking at the next five years time and then there will be another Leah Totten Leah Totten uh, uh, SPACT uh, group. You know, we had Catherine Day, we had Brian McMahon. We don't want to have any other expert group in the next five years. Yes, I, I think you summed it up that um, for 20 years we have had continuous reports from various groups, various organizations, from asylum activists, and only now, you know, it took 21 plus years, 23, 24 years from when direct provision was first proposed, for suddenly there to be at least an acknowledgement that direct provision violates human rights. Um, and, and just be, before I come on to Fiona, just want to bring a, a few other comments and, and uh, Abdullahi who, who, who notes that he's seeking asylum in Ireland, like Ola, he does kind of see the white paper as having the potential to be positive, um, but also kind of um, other um, uh, speakers note that kind of like, well, what about persons in direct provision right now? If government have acknowledged finally, and by God belatedly, it's a gross violation of human rights, 
what about asylum seekers right now? Fiona, any comments or thoughts on, on any of the questions or, or comments that, um, that I brought you? Um, yeah, thanks, Liam. And I, I think going back to your initial question there, we're asking, you know, was direct provision going to be considered like a stain on Irish society? I think without question, yes. And I think that's been kind of widely accepted. Um, if the white paper has the potential to end direct provision, I think yes, but there's a very big question. It has to be implemented. And I think uh, the key lies there in implementation. And I absolutely agree with Ola when she's saying, like, we can't get complacent now. We can't kind of say, oh, look, the white paper's there. It's great. There's a plan for end direct provision. It's around that kind of sustained campaigning, the sustained engagement and remaining involved. And um, going back to people who are currently in direct provision, again, I think I'd go back to our initial point is that we have to, if we start bringing in that case processing system, whereby people who are in direct provision for two years or more currently in the system are granted a permission to remain so they can leave the system and get on with their lives. I think that would have a twofold, I think A, it would send a very clear message to people in direct provision that this time is different. This is not just another re report. And secondly, it makes a transition from an old firm from the direct provision system across to the new system a lot more, e a lot easier, and a lot kind of I think more attainable because you're not dealing at the moment. You have seven thousand eight hundred odd people in direct provision. The current wait times are twenty months. For a first, uh, for, for a first instance, so I mean these 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 are unsustainable. So something clearly has to be done to address that. And one way to do it is to clear the backlog. People who are living in direct provision with a residency permission help these people to move out and rebuild their lives, and then start moving everybody across to the new system with a more manageable number. So looking at sort of a system that has about three thousand five hundred people within within the system at any one time. Thanks, Fiona. And you also kind of answered a number of questions asked by Nessa and, and, and a number of others on kind of, you know, the two year um, commitment that those win the system as of two years in December 2020, did they recommendation be granted um, some form of um, some form of status and um, to anyone on the panel. Um, a key issue that has come up in a number of the questions from both anonymous um, questions, but also from, uh, from others, and I've lost some of your names, apologies of asking the questions, but what can be done right now? What do you think is something that simply needs to be done right now? Ola, maybe we'll start with you. Right now, clear the backlog, right, right now. I don't see... I don't see any magic happening with transition into a new system with over 7,000 people right now. Nah, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. The homeless crisis has been, it has been getting worse and worse and worse over the years. If it is that easy to tackle such, such problem, people would have left emergency accommodation centers all, all these years. So I think the immediate action now, clear the backlog, give people the, 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 the they uh, uh, live to remain and then transition to the new system with the, the fewer um, number of people that is left. It was done when I came in, 20, in, in 2014 and a lot of people, I remember I was staying in two rooms with, with three of my children and I would, the, the last one has additional needs. And it, despite the fact that the GP was recommending give additional space to this child to support his growth, to support his development and all that, there, there wasn't any space anyway. And until those people were, were pushed out, I didn't get any other alternative um, accommodation. So if government is committed to, you know, meeting up that timeline of, of abolishing this system by 2024, then let people go on their merry way. Send, send people, clear the backlog, send people, let people transition out of the system and then start on a clean, a clean slate with, with the fewer number of uh, applicants that you have. Thanks. Uh, Bulalani, any thoughts? Um, the fact that well, uh, it, it also relates to processing. One of the things that has been a problem for us in the movement of asylum seekers in Ireland is the processing of asylum decisions. One, um, there isn't a, legal, a, a legally binding deadline for processing asylum claims in Ireland, um, and we've, something we've campaigned for 
who impose that statutory limit on the on how long an asylum seeker is to wait for a decision on their asylum claim and the consequences of failure to make that deadline being that the person is given permission to stay in Ireland. Uh, we haven't seen that uh, being even considered by the Irish state. They don't want to accept, uh, put it on the statutory uh, framing that, you know, an asylum seeker is not expected to wait longer than this. Um, but yet we've seen uh, people waiting for years and years uh, for decisions on, on their asylum claim. The very fact that a person has to wait for longer than a year uh, to be invited to an interview uh, or to get a first instance decision, that is uh, 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 deeply devastating for uh, a person to keep a person in limbo uh, for that long. And so we need to see a clear commitment in terms of imposing deadlines uh, and sticking to those deadlines to ensure that the system runs smoothly. Otherwise, uh, we will still be back to the same old limbo. If you could put me, uh, Liam, into the Western Hotel uh, in, uh, in Westmoreland Street in Dublin, and you gave me all the best supports that you could give me in terms of healthcare and access to education and the rest of it. Uh, without that certainty of how long am I going to stay there, that Westmoreland, uh, that Western Hotel will become an open prison because you are keeping, uh, keeping me in a state of limbo. So it's not just seeking uh, better living conditions for asylum seekers, but also concerns about the legal process, but ensuring that people have access to that legal support. It does say so in the uh, white paper that people will have that access to legal support. It was a recommendation by the Catherine Day Group to ensure that asylum seekers have access to one, legal aid when they want to take cases on judicial review. But remember, we've, seen, we've been highlighting the problems with first instance decisions and the, the reasons that people are rejected. So for instance, they tell a, a survivor of sexual violence to justify why they were raped. Um, they might ask an LGBTQ plus person to prove their sexual orientation. And um, they don't believe them if they don't know where the George Bar is or they don't believe them um, uh, if they've, uh, 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 they're not part of an LGBTQ plus organization. Um, and those are things that needs to be changed going forward because if we still maintain that same attitude towards the determination of the status determination process, uh, we'll still be stuck with uh, asylum seekers in uh, whatever system we impose. And the other problem, of course, is that if we move towards getting uh, quick uh, decisions uh, without necessarily addressing the right to work restrictions, uh, for instance, you could end up with asylum seekers waiting uh, for a very long time for an asylum uh, a final decision on the asylum claim without ever being allowed to work if they are given a first instance decision uh, within the first five months. They were working towards improving processing. Uh, I think their target was around nine months. And if they work on reducing it further, and they will be allowed to do so because there aren't a lot of new people coming into the asylum system due to the pandemic and travel restrictions. They might meet that deadline of uh, issuing a first instance decision before uh, six months. And it will be problematic for us if we have mass exclusion of people from uh, accessing the labor market because it has created already in the system of direct provision disparities. So you have people in direct provision who are allowed to work and you have people in direct provision who aren't allowed to work. And that for us is an injustice uh, because what you it, it is cruel to make one person watch other people live uh, their lives and tell that other person that they aren't allowed to uh, do all the things that human beings do in this state. And so there are uh, uh, problems that we foresee if all the ducks in the, uh, if the government doesn't get all the ducks in the row, so in terms of processing of asylum claims, but also changing the way accommodation is provided. I can talk forever. Thanks, for Lila, thanks, for Lilani. And um, 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 sorry, my computer is playing up, but no, uh, we're okay. And, and that answers several of kind of the delegates' questions on kind of processing issues, legal advice, access to legal advice, and and such. Just want to bring you some thoughts and questions of a number of people now. And and uh, Fiona, we'll come to you yourself first. Sarah Clancy asks, um, you know, first. Does the Green Party, and, and I might kind of expand that question, do all political parties really want to expend the political capital in delivering the white paper? And then Sarah also reminds us that not-for-profit does not mean it's inherently good. We unfortunately have so many examples in Ireland of not-for-profit institutions, which were absolutely horrendous. And I think that's extraordinarily important. Uh, and, and Sarah Clancy does, does highlight religious orders as being one of those examples. 
Um, and then kind of question from Ronald Lentil and Ruth McAvoy, and I'm kind of, kind of mashing this together. It's about the role that NGOs, civil society organizations are to play in the delivery of the white paper. Aren't there really significant concerns that NGOs may be the ones implementing systems that we now criticize government for implementing. Fiona, do you have any reflections on that? And then I'll come to the, uh, the other um, Yeah, sure, Liam. Um, I agree with um, Sarah Clancy that the fact that something is not for profit doesn't necessarily automatically mean it's good. Um, you know, what needs to happen is people need to be provided with proper, adequate accommodation. Um, and I think the, the for-profit element, I think that stems from the current model and the current model is completely you know, driven by profits. But there are, if you want, for, for better word, a for-profit providers that can, um, or private providers that can, given the right model, I think produce or, or, or provide proper accommodation. Um, what was the, um, the second question to that, Liam? I, it was in relation to, I suppose, the white paper envisages a very extensive role for non-governmental organizations, civil society bodies in meeting commitments. Yeah. Would there be a concern that that kind of NGOs will then be in the place of government that kind of potentially engage in behaviors that we now criticize the government engaging in within direct oh, provision? Yeah, I, I, I see what you mean. Um, I think that will be down to um, the individual NGOs, but I, but I, I, I get that point. I think there is possibly an inherent risk that the NGO becomes like a service provider on behalf of the state. Um, and I mean, I can only talk about NASP's perspective, and that that's not something I think that um, we would, we, you know, we would be supportive of. I think as as an NGO, it's critically important to be able to have that voice to criticize government and that should not in any way be dependent on whether or not you're you know whether or not you're funded by the state or not and i think maybe if you are delivering a service again it depends on the service that you deliver it depends on how that's delivered i mean it's done well in the homelessness sector so you have you know you have simon simon and you have focus ireland delivering homelessness services and if you like i suppose on behalf of the state and i think it can work well but there are there are there are inherent risks in that yeah yeah i would absolutely agree with that and ola or uh, bulalani um ola can do you think the political parties will use their political capital? And then if you want to comment on kind of the, the potential risks that there may be with NGOs being the ones delivering, at least in part, services under the new white bear paper model. I, I think the, the, the problem with, 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 the, with the whole asylum system is it, it's not seen as a priority. So I don't see political parties expending their, their resources on on um, making sure that this system is abolished or or you know I don't I, I don't know I don't have that much faith or <laughs> will I say much trust in political parties getting it so much you know except for for the glorification of their of their parties if I if I may if I may put it that way you know uh, yeah, the, the election is right right around the corner so they might they might do so with ulterior motives you know of, of getting reelected in the upcoming and in the next election but as far as you know genuine concern for these the, the injustices that has been done in this system i don't think they they they, they are so so particular about that you know we, we we should be grateful for what we have you know we, we we're offering you the best the best of the best so why why do you want more you know much much always wants more like somebody said to me <laughs> one time and and as regards um ngos oh uh, I don't know. It, 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 there's this kind of a love-hate kind of relationship between me and NGOs in Ireland, you know. And we used to have a resident here who would fight tooth and nail when any NGO comes in here. And he goes, "It is because of you people that we stay here for years and we don't leave." And then you begin to wonder, like, why are you so angry? And then he goes, "Hola, you see these people. They get money from from government." And then they come here and harvest information. They, they hear us talk and then they, they take what we, we say back to their government and then they get money and then nothing is done. Stop coming here and, and all that, you know. And if you if you look at um, some of the NGOs as well, especially those that incentivizes the, the kind of, uh, the, the way they get asylum seekers to interact with them, it just, it's so, it's so irritating, you know. 
you can't um, provide uh, force me to engage with you. You know, if you are providing services on behalf of government, leave me to 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 decide if I want to engage with you or if I do not want to engage with you. You know, don't don't. Uh, and then you get them saying if you attend, then there's a uh, there are vouchers and there are these and that. Are you buying information for government? Are you buying me to take sides with your NGO so that you get more funding from government and all that? You know, it's I, I don't know. I don't, it's that's why I have uh I have few chosen NGOs that I so much interact with, and you would always see my face on whatever it is that they that they organize. You know, I um it's um 50-50, if I if I may if I may put it that way. Thanks very much, Ola. Bulalani, any thoughts on um, either the political capital issue or kind of that that issue that Fiona raised about kind of NGOs being in an exceptionally difficult space if they decide to become, in essence, service providers for government. But some are already service providers for the government. There are NGOs who are paid money by the Irish government to provide support services to asylum seekers. The fundamental problem there is the power relationship um, that is then constructed between uh, who the person who provides the service and the person who uses the service. Um, because quite a lot of uh, 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 our concerns with direct provision has always been around uh, the power structures that, you know, you have the power to determine a person's uh, 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 life. You, 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 the influence, the degree of influence you have on the person's uh, uh, life on, uh, uh, when you're providing a service to them uh, is for us problematic. Um, it's, problematic when uh, you have people stripping others of their agency and NGOs, uh, 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 both pro for profit and not for profit bodies have done that uh, in stripping people uh, of their personal autonomy in the way they deliver services. But also there is an expectation from my engagement from uh, with the NGOs that you should be grateful for what you have. And quite a lot of them didn't understand for a very long time uh, while we may have allies in, in NGOs, we have people in NGOs who didn't understand what asylum seekers were complaining about because, you know, the conditions for homeless people aren't so great in emergency accommodation either. So you have single people in homeless accommodation, for instance, in emergency accommodation, um, bunk beds, some even things that look like mats on the floor, uh, you know, those exercise uh, mattresses that people use in, in gymnastics. They had laid them laid out on the floor in some of the emergency accommodation before the pandemic. Uh, for people to to stay in overnight, and they were paid money by the Irish government to deliver that service uh, at over a hundred euro by local authorities who, 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 who contracted them, a um, uh, hundred euro per night to be sleeping on a mat on the floor. Uh, they don't call it a mat on the floor. I don't know what they call it, uh, but there is a problem there. Um, if without clear guidelines in terms of uh, written law or how they are going to be involved. Uh, um, what uh, th their limits uh, in terms of power that they will exercise over the people who are coming to uh, seek protection in Ireland in terms of what support services they provide. Uh, we need to see those on paper um, um, so that we are able to hold them to account for their behavior. Sarah reminded me of a, 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 a situation we had in Ireland in, in the 1950s when Hungarians lived in, uh, in, 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 in Noklesin direct provision center. It wasn't a direct provision center, of course, in the 1950s. It was a, uh, a refugee camp for Hungarian refugees who had come to Ireland. Uh, one of the NGOs who ran that, uh, 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 who was providing services to asylum seekers, actually called them ungrateful when they were protesting um, and uh, 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 against the conditions that they were living. They even had a hunger strike at one point in the 1950s in Nokanshi. And that kind of attitude for me doesn't uh, uh, tell me, uh, me that they have uh, the best interest of the asylum seeker. Um, so we are concerned that whose best interest they will be serving, but also concerned that uh, NGOs uh, should never be uh, seeking to replace the government in providing services um, to the state. The job of an NGO is to hold the state to account, to account for its, uh, uh, its uh, 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 decisions and policy and the administration of those decisions, but not to replace the state in providing services. We exist, uh, 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 there are times when NGOs step in, which is to provide the services that is not being provided by the state. You need to draw a clear distinction then that it is the state's responsibility to ensure that asylum seekers have these support services. And so we, we lines get blurry 
when you use, start using NGOs as your mode of, of delivering services in terms of who has authority to do this. Thanks, Bulalani. We have just a few moments left, so I'm just going to ask all panelists. Were, um, Marie Keenan asked, were you directly consulted on the white paper? So Bulalani and Fiona, you would have been on the advisory group, but were all the panelists um, consulted on the white paper in, in any kind of form? Bulalani's indicating yes, Fiona? Yeah, there was a consultation. Um, it was a short consultation process. Um, and there were a number of protection applicants as well. Um, so there was, there was, there was a consultation process. Yeah. Um, could it have been better? Yeah, I think so. Um, but I think the time scale that they had put on it was was a lot shorter. But there was, there was a consultation process. Um, and, and then I suppose there's just kind of just to wrap up questions now, because we are almost out of time. Uh, Steph Hanlon kind of notes about kind of this issue of discretion and regulating the lives of asylum seekers that Ola and Bulalani have both um, kind of both highlighted. And I think your responses in essence kind of responded to Steph's question and also a, a another question about kind of the importance or maybe a comment on the importance of legislation that we had um, direct provision um, for 20 years, well, for 18 of its 20 years lacking a legislative basis. Um, um, and while a legislative basis doesn't approve direct provision, it at least opens up avenues for challenging direct provision at least a little bit easier um, 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 and then others sharing experiences of their their treatment and direct provision the difficulties they face lack of access to bank accounts uh, lack of access to driving licenses some with lack of access to employment something that uh, that, that kind of Bulani, i think it was that mentioned there's certain people in centers who will have access to work many others who will um, uh, will uh, not, and then kind of other comments on kind of the bureaucratic nature of the um, of the state. Right, there's one final question. Apologies for not getting to everyone's questions, but I'm going to put the final question to all the panel. You have one minute. <clears throat> what key points? Nessun Vaughan asks. What key points do we need to advocate for immediately right now? Ola, we'll start with you. And I've said it before, it's clearing the backlog. To be honest, I am I am sick and tired of of you know the endless, endless wait, especially for those who whose cases have, have proceeded to to a court or who have been signing. I, I met someone who said she has been signing since 2016. And it's still on deportation up till now. That's unfair. That is that is really unfair. Why would somebody spend five years signing, uh, uh, you know, at the GNIB? Why not just grant them the leave to remain and, and you know, they've established a life here. They they have ties to to the Irish society. They've built their lives here. Why would you keep them, you know, leave them signing for 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 years? We have people who, who says they've been signing since 2018. This is 2021, and they are still they're still being they're still signing. You know, I think those it, it should. There should be some kind of a pathway for those people to, you know, for 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 those people to to um, regularize their their, their their stay in 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 the country. Um, yeah, that that would that would Ola? be. Yeah. That that's yours. We need yeah. to kind of stop, stop, uh, stop. regularize stay or or, or yeah. acknowledge the actual stay of individuals in the state and provide them with the rights that they are entitled to. Fiona Finn. Um, yeah, I agree with I agree with Ola. Um, clearing the backlog, also like really simple things: driver's license, um, access to bank accounts. Asylum seekers have been asking for this for um, for, for for years now. There are easy things that can be done, but also in the context of the white paper, we need to see a really clear implementation plan now because there is a sketch of an implementation plan in the report but it needs to be very 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 detailed as to you know what, what's going to happen when and how so at least that way it can be monitored and the state can be held to account where it's falling down so i think clear implementation plan we need to make um the white paper a reality not just another report and final word to yourself Bulalani. 
uh, first one, we need to make sure that the aspirations of, uh, uh, that are espoused in the white paper, at least the good ones, uh, 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 written in law, uh, so that we have a framework with which to uh, challenge those unfair decisions and practices should they arise. Uh, but also to protect against potential harm in the future because we have seen it in the past 20 years in the absence of legislative basis for draft provision. Uh, the second one, of course, is to clear the backlog. I mean, uh, clearing the backlog could be in the uh, Irish state twofold. They could either give you permission to stay in the country or they could expedite deportations and issue them in March. Um, they could easily do that, like arrange flights for people to get uh, to, to, to be sent back to where they came from. Um, uh, they would have no issue doing that part. So what we need to push for is to ensure that they do actually grant permission to remain. The minister has discretionary power to grant permission to remain to any non-EU national in the state. Um, and they could easily do that for people who are currently in direct provision um, and assist them to live independently in the, uh, uh, in the community and get out and actually start closing some of their direct provision centers. There's no uh, legal impediment to doing so. The, the third part, of course, is to ensure that the, the, the people who are already in direct provision with deportation orders have been because some of them have actually been in the system for many, many years. In the uh, 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 advisory group report, there is a recognition that there are people who are issued with a deportation order in the state who actually cannot uh, be deported to their country where the state has no way of deporting them to their country or, or, hab or habitual residence or, or, or region. That is called non-retainable. Uh, but the state still issues deportation orders to them as part of the process. And so there is a, 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 a need to, to, to deal with that. Uh, 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 and the Minister of Justice, again, is responsible for that. I'd have to say that we'll be seeking a meeting as Masi with the Minister for Justice to have a discussion um, on many of the issues that affect the Department of Justice, both stemming from the uh, Catherine Day uh, report, uh, but also in, uh, in, the, you know, in the absence uh, of uh, clarity uh, in, in the white paper on their role um, in providing services to asylum seekers. Thank you very much to um, Fiona, to Bulalani, and to Ola for offering your experience and expertise today. I think a key message that you have all put across is that the white paper is only a first step. And we have a comment in from one of Ireland's foremost public interest litigators and public interest law activists, Michael Farrell, that there's a lot of work and a lot of campaigning to do on this, and that needs to begin immediately. Thanks to all our speakers. To, thanks to all those who've attended as delegates to the webinar. Apologies to those whose questions I did, did simply not have time to get to. Um, so um, until the next time, please contact your TDs, please contact political parties and let them know that you want a system for persons seeking international protection that fundamentally protects their human rights, their dignity, their privacy and autonomy. Take care and stay well. Goodbye. And Ola, Fiona and Volani, we know to end the seminar, we're still actually going live, but um, we can't go back into private mode. So thanks very much for everything. People Thank will be you. able to see this part. So um, listen, take care and I'll chat to you soon. All right. All right. Thanks, Thank Liam. Much, yeah. Thanks, Ola. Thanks, Bolalani. Bye. Nice to see you again, Bolalani. I'm seeing you in a while. You <laughs> must be sick know, of each other. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Hi, guys. You were all great. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>